if they were asked to name the greatest English novelist, would say, after perhaps a few moments' hesitation, Charles Dickens. Most of his many books are powerful and lively attacks on the social evils of his day, poverty, exploitation and injustice. But Pickwick Papers, his first full-length work, is different. When Dickens was only 24, poor and unknown to the public, the publishers Chapman and Hall asked him to write a series of sporting adventures, really as a framework for some sporting pictures by a well-known artist. The work appeared in monthly instalments, 20 of them altogether. And when it was finished, Dickens was famous and no longer poor, and the world had a new comic masterpiece. The book recounts the adventures of four gentlemen as they travel around England during 1827 and 1828. Samuel Pickwick himself, their acknowledged leader, the romantic Mr. Tracy Tupman, devoted to the ladies, the poetic Augustus Snodgrass, and Nathaniel Winkle, whose ambition it was to be admired as a sportsman. One of their earliest adventures took place at the village of Dingley Dell in Kent, where the four gentlemen were guests of the hospitable Mr. Wardle and his family. The rich, sweet smell of the hayricks rose to his chamber window. The hundred perfumes of the little flower garden beneath scented the air around. The deep green meadows shone in the morning dew that glistened on every leaf as it trembled in the gentle air and the birds sang as if every sparkling drop were a fountain of inspiration to them. Mr. Pickwick fell into an enchanting and delicious reverie. Hello, was the sound that roused him. He looked to the right, but he saw nobody. His eyes wandered to the left and pierced the prospect. He stared into the sky, but he wasn't wanted there. And then he did what a common mind would have done at once, looked into the garden, and there saw Mr. Wardle. How are you? said the good-humoured individual, out of breath with his own anticipation of pleasure. Beautiful morning, ain't it? Glad to see you up so early. Make haste down and come out. I'll wait for you here. Mr Pickwick needed no second invitation. Ten minutes sufficed for the completion of his toilet, and at the expiration of that time he was by the old gentleman's side. Hello, said Mr Pickwick in his turn, seeing that his companion was armed with a gun and that another lay ready on the grass. What's going forward? Why, your friend and I, replied the host, are going out rook shooting before breakfast. He's a very good shot, ain't he? Well, I've heard him say he's a capital one, replied Pickwick, but I never saw him aim at anything. Well, said the host, I wish he'd come. Joe! Joe! The fat boy, who, under the exciting influence of the morning, did not appear to be more than three parts of a fraction asleep, emerged from the house. Go up and call the gentleman and tell him he'll find me and Mr. Pickwick in the rookery. Show the gentleman the way there, do you hear? The boy departed to execute his commission, and the host, carrying both guns like a second Robinson Crusoe, led the way from the garden. This is the place, said the old gentleman, pausing after a few minutes walking in an avenue of trees. The information was unnecessary, for the incessant cawing of the unconscious rooks sufficiently indicated their whereabout. The old gentleman laid one gun on the ground and loaded the other. Here they are, said Mr Pickwick, and as he spoke, the forms of Mr Tupman, Mr Snodgrass and Mr Winkle appeared in the distance. The fat boy, not being quite certain which gentleman he was directed to call, had, with peculiar sagacity, and to prevent the possibility of any mistake, called them all. Come along, shouted the old gentleman, addressing Mr Winkle. A keen hand like you ought to have been up long ago, even to such poor work as this. Mr. Winkle responded with a forced smile and took the spare gun with an expression of countenance which a metaphysical rook, impressed with a foreboding of his approaching death by violence, may be supposed to assume. It might have been keenness, but it looked remarkably like misery. The old gentleman nodded, and two ragged boys who had been marshalled to the spot forthwith commenced climbing up two of the trees. "'What are those lads for?' inquired Mr. Pickwick abruptly. He was rather alarmed for he was not quite certain, but that the distress of the agricultural interest, about which he had often heard a great deal, might have compelled the small boys attached to the soil to earn a precarious and hazardous subsistence by making marks of themselves for inexperienced sportsmen. <laughs> Only to start the game, replied Mr. Wardle, laughing. To what? inquired Mr. Pickwick. Why, in plain English, to frighten the rooks. Oh, is that all? You're satisfied? Quite. Quite. 
Very well. Shall I begin? If you please, said Mr. Winkle, glad of any respite. Stand aside, then. Now for it. The boy shouted and shook a branch with a nest on it. Half a dozen young rooks in violent conversation flew out to ask what the matter was. The old gentleman fired by way of reply. Down fell one bird and off flew the others. Take him up, Joe, said the old gentleman. There was a smile on the youth's face as he advanced. Indistinct visions of rook pie floated through his imagination. He laughed as he retired with the bird. It was a plump one. Now, Mr. Winkle, said the host, reloading his own gun, fire away. Mr. Winkle advanced and levelled his gun. Mr. Pickwick and his friends cowered involuntarily to escape damage from the heavy fall of rooks which they felt quite certain would be occasioned by the devastating barrel of their friend. There was a solemn pause. A shout, a flapping of wings, a faint click. Hello, said the old gentleman. Won't it go, inquired Mr. Pickwick. Missed fire, said Mr. Winkle, who was very pale, probably from disappointment. Odd, said the old gentleman, taking the gun. Never knew one of them to miss fire before. Why, I don't see anything of the cap. Bless my soul, said Mr. Winkle. I declare I forgot the cap. The slight omission was rectified. Mr. Pickwick crouched again. Mr. Winkle stepped forward with an air of determination and resolution, and Mr. Tupman looked out from behind a tree. The boy shouted. Four birds flew out. Mr. Winkle fired. There was a scream, as of an individual, not a rook, in corporeal anguish. Mr. Tupman had saved the lives of innumerable unoffending birds by receiving a portion of the charge in his left arm. To describe the confusion that ensued would be impossible. To tell how Mr. Pickwick, in the first transports of his emotion, called Mr. Winkle wretch, and how Mr. Tupman lay prostrate on the ground, and how Mr. Winkle knelt horror-stricken beside him, how Mr. Tupman called distractedly upon some feminine Christian name, and then first opened one eye, and then the other, and then fell back and shut them both. All this would be as difficult to describe in detail as it would be to depict the gradual recovering of the unfortunate individual the binding up of his arm with pocket handkerchiefs, and the conveying him back by slow degrees, supported by the arms of his anxious friends. They drew near the house. The ladies were at the garden gate, waiting for their arrival and their breakfast. The spinster aunt appeared. She smiled and beckoned them to walk quicker. It was evident she knew not of their disaster. Poor thing. There are times when ignorance is bliss indeed. They approached nearer. Why, what is the matter with the little old gentleman, said Isabella Wardle. The spinster aunt heeded not the remark. She thought it applied to Mr. Pickwick. In her eyes, Tracy Tupman was a youth. She viewed his years through a diminishing glass. Don't be frightened, called out the old host, fearful of alarming his daughters. The little party had crowded so completely round Mr. Tupman that they could not yet clearly discern the nature of the accident. Don't be frightened, said the host. What's the matter, screamed the ladies. Mr. Tupman has met with a little accident, that's all. The spinster aunt uttered a piercing scream, burst into an hysteric laugh, and fell backwards in the arms of her nieces. Throw some cold water over her, said the old gentleman. No, no, murmured the spinster aunt. I I'm better now. Bella, Emily, a surgeon. Is he wounded? Is he dead? Is he... Ha, ha, ha. Here the spinster aunt burst into fit number two of hysteric laughter, interspersed with screams. Calm yourself, said Mr. Tupman, affected almost to tears by this expression of sympathy with his suffering. Dear, dear madam, calm yourself. It is his voice, exclaimed the spinster aunt, and strong symptoms of fit number three developed themselves forthwith. Do not agitate yourself, I entreat you, dearest madam, said Mr. Tupman soothingly. I am very little hurt, I assure you. Then you are not dead, ejaculated the hysterical lady. Oh, say you are not dead. Don't be a fool, Rachel, interposed Mr. Wardle rather more roughly than was quite consistent with the poetic nature of the scene. What the devil's the use of his saying he isn't dead? No, no, I'm not, said Mr. Tupman. I require no assistance but yours. Let me lean on your arm, he added in a whisper. Oh, Miss Rachel. The agitated female advanced and offered her arm. 
They turned into the breakfast parlour. Mr. Tracy Tupman gently pressed her hand to his lips and sank upon the sofa. Are you faint? inquired the anxious Rachel. No, said Mr. Tupman. It's nothing. I shall be better presently. He closed his eyes. He sleeps, murmured the spinster aunt. His organs of vision had been closed for nearly twenty seconds. Dear, dear Mr. Tupman. Mr. Tupman jumped up. Oh, say those words again, he exclaimed. The lady started. Surely you did not hear them, she said bashfully. Oh, yes, I did, replied Mr. Tupman. Repeat them. If you would have me recover, repeat them. Hush, said the lady, my brother. Mr. Tracy Tupman resumed his former position, and Mr. Wardle, accompanied by a surgeon, entered the room. The arm was examined, the wound dressed, and pronounced to be a very slight one, and the minds of the company having been thus satisfied, they proceeded to satisfy their appetites with countenances to which an expression of cheerfulness was again restored. Mr. Pickwick alone was silent and reserved. Doubt and distrust were exhibited in his countenance. His confidence in Mr. Winkle had been shaken, greatly shaken, by the proceedings of the morning. On a later visit to Mr. Wardle's home at Dingley Dell, Mr. Pickwick and his companions meet two young medical students from London, Mr. Bob Sawyer and Mr. Benjamin Allen. Mr. Sawyer invites them all to a party he plans to give for a few student friends at his lodgings in London in two weeks' time. The invitation is accepted, but unhappily for Bob Sawyer, just before his guests begin to arrive, he has a terrible row with his landlady, Mrs. Raddle, over his failure to pay the rent. Does Mr. Sawyer live here, said Mr. Pickwick, when the door was opened? Yes, said the girl. First floor. It's the door straight afore you when he gets to the top of the stairs. Having given this instruction, the handmaid, who had been brought up amongst the aboriginal inhabitants of Southwark, disappeared, with the candle in her hand, down the kitchen stairs, perfectly satisfied that she'd done everything that could possibly be required of her under the circumstances. Mr. Snodgrass, who entered last, secured the street door, after several ineffectual efforts, by putting up the chain, and the friends stumbled upstairs, where they were received by Mr. Bob Sawyer, who had been afraid to go down, lest he should be waylaid by Mrs. Raddle. "'How are you?' said the discomfited student. "'Glad to see you. Take care of the glasses.' This caution was addressed to Mr. Pickwick, who had put his hat on the tray. "'Oh, dear me,' said Mr. Pickwick, "'I beg your pardon.' Don't mention it, don't mention it, said Bob Sawyer. I'm rather confined for room here, but you must put up with all that when you come to see a young bachelor. Walk in. You've seen this gentleman before, I think. Mr. Pickwick shook hands with Mr. Benjamin Allen, and his friends followed his example. They had scarcely taken their seats when there was another double knock. I hope that's Jack Hopkins, said Mr. Sawyer. Hush. Yes, it is. Come up, Jack. Come up. A heavy footstep was heard on the stairs, and Jack Hopkins presented himself. He wore a black velvet waistcoat with thunder and lightning buttons and a blue striped shirt with a white false collar. You're late, Jack, said Mr. Benjamin Allen. Been detained at Bartholomew's, replied Hopkins. Anything new? No, nothing particular. Rather a good accident brought into the casualty ward. What was that, sir? inquired Mr. Pickwick. Only a man fallen out of a four-pair of stairs window, but it's a very fair case, very fair case indeed. Do you mean that the patient is in a fair way to recover, inquired Mr. Pickwick? No, replied Hopkins carelessly. No, I should rather say that he wouldn't. There must be a splendid operation, though, tomorrow. Magnificent sight if Slasher does it. You consider Mr. Slasher a good operator, said Mr. Pickwick? Best alive, replied Hopkins. Took a boy's leg right out of the socket last week. Boy ate five apples and a gingerbread cake. Exactly two minutes after it was all over, Boy said he wouldn't lie there to be made game of, and he'd tell his mother if they didn't begin. Dear me, said Mr Pickwick, astonished. Pooh, that's nothing, that ain't, said Jack Hopkins. Is it, Bob? Nothing at all, replied Mr Bob Sawyer. <laughs> 
By the by, Bob, said Hopkins, with scarcely a perceptible glance at Mr Pickwick's attentive face, we had a curious accident last night. A child was brought in who'd swallowed a necklace. Swallowed what, sir? interrupted Mr Pickwick. A necklace, replied Jack Hopkins. Not all at once, you know. That'd be too much. You couldn't swallow that if the child did, eh, Mr Pickwick? <laughs> no, the way was this. Child's parents were poor people who lived in a court. Child's eldest sister bought a necklace, common necklace made of large black wooden beads. Child, being fond of toys, cribbed the necklace, hid it, played with it, cut the string and swallowed a bead. Child thought it capital fun, went back next day and swallowed another bead. Bless my heart, said Mr Pickwick, what a dreadful thing. I beg your pardon, sir. Go on. Next day, Child swallowed two beads. The day after that, he treated himself to three and so on, till, in a week's time, he got through the necklace. Five and twenty beads in all. The sister, who was an industrious girl and seldom treated herself to a bit of finery, cried her eyes out at the loss of the necklace, looked high and low for it, but, I needn't say, didn't find it. A few days afterwards, the family were at dinner, baked shoulder of mutton and potatoes under it. The child, who wasn't hungry, was playing about the room, when suddenly there was heard a devil of a noise like a small hailstorm. Don't do that, my boy, said the father. I ain't doing nothing, said the child. Well, don't do it again, said the father. There was a short silence, and then the noise began again, worse than ever. If you don't mind what I say, my boy, said the father, you'll find yourself in bed in something less than a pig's whisper. He gave the child a shake to make him obedient, and such a rattling ensued as nobody ever heard before. Why, dammy, it's in the child, said the father. He's got the croup in the wrong place. No, I haven't, father, said the child, beginning to cry. It's the necklace. I swallowed it, father. The father caught the child up and ran with him to the hospital. The beads in the boy's stomach rattling all the way with a jolting, and the people looking up in the air and down in the cellars to see where the unusual sound come from. He's in the hospital now, said Jack Hopkins, and he makes such a devil of a noise when he walks about that they're obliged to muffle him in a watchman's coat for fear he should wake the patients. That's the most extraordinary case I've ever heard of, said Mr Pickwick with an emphatic blow on the table. Oh, that's nothing, said Jack Hopkins, is it, Bob? Certainly not, replied Bob Sawyer. Very singular things occur in our profession, I can assure you, sir, said Hopkins. So I should be disposed to imagine, replied Mr Pickwick. Another knock at the door announced a large-headed young man in a black wig, who brought with him a scorbutic youth in a long stock. The next comer was a gentleman in a shirt emblazoned with pink anchors, who was closely followed by a pale youth with a plated watchguard. The arrival of a prim personage in clean linen and cloth boots rendered the party complete. The little table with the green baize cover was wheeled out. The first instalment of punch was brought in, in a white jug. And the succeeding three hours were devoted to vingt et un at sixpence a dozen. <laughs> After supper, another jug of punch was put upon the table, together with a paper of cigars and a couple of bottles of spirits. Then there was an awful pause, and this awful pause was occasioned by a very common occurrence in this sort of place, but a very embarrassing one notwithstanding. The fact is, the girl was washing the glasses. The establishment boasted four. We do not record the circumstance as at all derogatory to Mrs. Raddle, for there never was a lodging house yet that was not short of glasses. The landlady's glasses were little, thin-blown glass tumblers, and those which had been borrowed from the public house were great, dropsical, bloated articles, each supported on a huge, gouty leg. This would have been in itself sufficient to have possessed the company with the real state of affairs, but the young woman of all work had prevented the possibility of any misconception arising in the mind of any gentleman upon the subject by forcibly dragging every man's glass away long before he'd finished his beer and audibly stating, despite the winks and interruptions of Mr Bob Sawyer, that it was to be conveyed downstairs and washed forthwith. It is a very ill wind that blows nobody any good. The prim man in the cloth boots, who had been unsuccessfully attempting to make a joke during the whole time the round game lasted, saw his opportunity and availed himself of it. The instant the glasses disappeared, he commenced a long story about a great public character 
whose name he had forgotten, making a particularly happy reply to another eminent and illustrious individual whom he had never been able to identify. He enlarged at some length, and with great minuteness upon diverse collateral circumstances distantly connected with the anecdote in hand. But for the life of him, he couldn't recollect at that precise moment what the anecdote was, although he'd been in the habit of telling the story with great applause for the last ten years. Dear me, said the prim man in the cloth boots, it is a very extraordinary circumstance. I'm sorry you've forgotten it, said Mr. Bob Sawyer, glancing eagerly at the door as he thought he heard the noise of glasses jingling. Very sorry. So am I, responded the prim man, because I know it would have afforded much amusement. Never mind. I dare say I shall manage to recollect it in the course of half an hour or so. The prim man arrived at this point just as the glasses came back, when Mr. Bob Sawyer, who had been absorbed in attention during the whole time, said he would very much like to hear the end of it, for so far as it went it was, without exception, the very best story he'd ever heard. The sight of the tumblers restored Bob Sawyer to a degree of equanimity which he had not possessed since his interview with his landlady. His face brightened up, and he began to feel quite convivial. Now, Betsy, said Mr. Bob Sawyer, with great suavity and dispersing at the same time the tumultuous little mop of glasses the girl had collected in the centre of the table. Now, Betsy, the warm water. Be brisk, is a good girl. You can't have no warm water, replied Betsy. "'No warm water!' exclaimed Mr. Bob Sawyer. "'No,' said the girl, with a shake of the head, "'which expressed a more decided negative "'than the most copious language could have conveyed. "'Mrs. Raddle said you weren't to have none.' "'The surprise depicted on the countenances of his guests "'imparted new courage to the host. "'Bring up the warm water instantly, instantly,' "'said Mr. Bob Sawyer, with desperate sternness. "'No, I can't,' replied the girl. "'Mrs. Raddle raked out the kitchen fire "'before she went to bed and locked up the kittle.' Mr. Bob Sawyer's heart-sickening attempts to rally under this last blow communicated a dispiriting influence to the company, the greater part of whom, with the view of raising their spirits, attached themselves with extra cordiality to the cold brandy and water. Now, said Jack Hopkins, just to set this going again, Bob, I don't mind singing a song. And Jack Hopkins, incited thereto by tumultuous applause, plunged himself at once into The King, God Bless Him, which he sang as loud as he could, to a novel air compounded of the Bay of Biscay and a frog he would. The chorus was the essence of the song, and, as each gentleman sang it to the tune he knew best, the effect was very striking indeed. It was at the end of the chorus to the first verse that Mr. Pickwick held up his hand in a listening attitude and said, as soon as silence was restored, Hush! I, I, I beg your pardon. I, I thought I heard someone calling from upstairs. A profound silence immediately ensued and Mr. Bob Sawyer was observed to turn pale. "'I think I hear it now,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'Have the goodness to open the door.' The door was no sooner opened than all doubt on the subject was removed. "'Mr. Sawyer! Mr. Sawyer!' screamed a voice from the two-pair landing. "'It's my landlady,' said Bob Sawyer, looking round him with great dismay. "'Yes. Yes, Mrs. Raddle?' "'What do you mean by this, Mr. Sawyer?' replied the voice, with great shrillness and rapidity of utterance. "'Ain't it enough to be swindled out of one's rent and money lent out of pocket besides, "'and abused and insulted by your friends that dares to call themselves men, "'without having the house turned out of the window and noise enough made to bring the fire engines here at two o'clock in the morning? "'Turn them wretches away!' "'You ought to be ashamed of yourself,' said the voice of Mr. Raddle, "'which appeared to proceed from beneath some distant bedclothes. "'Ashamed of themselves,' said Mrs. Raddle. "'Why don't you go down and knock em every one downstairs? "'You would if you was a man.' "'I should if I was a dozen men, my dear,' replied Mr. Raddle pacifically. "'But they've the advantage of me in numbers, my dear.' "'Oh, you coward!' replied Mrs. Raddle with supreme contempt. "'Do you mean to turn them wretches out or not, Mr. Sawyer?' "'They're going, Mrs. Raddle, they're going,' said the miserable Bob. "'I'm afraid you'd better go,' said Mr. Bob Sawyer to his friends.' I thought you were making too much noise. It's a very unfortunate thing, said the prim man, just as we were getting so comfortable too. The prim man was just beginning to have a dawning recollection of the story that he'd forgotten. It's hardly to be borne, said the prim man, looking round. Hardly to be borne, is it? Not to be endured, replied Jack Hopkins. Let's have the other verse, Bob. Come on, here goes. No, no, Jack, don't, interposed Bob Sawyer. It's a capital song, but I'm afraid we'd better not have the other verse. They are very violent people, the people of the house. 
Shall I step upstairs and pitch into the landlord, inquired Hopkins, or keep on ringing the bell, or go and groan on the staircase? You may command me, Bob. I'm very much indebted to you for your friendship and good nature, Hopkins, said the wretched Mr. Bob Sawyer, but I think the best plan to avoid any further dispute is for us to break up at once. Now, Mr. Sawyer, screamed the shrill voice of Mrs. Raddle, are them brutes going? They're only looking for their hats, Mrs. Raddle, said Bob. They're going directly. Going, said Mrs. Raddle, thrusting her nightcap over the banisters, just as Mr. Pickwick, followed by Mr. Tupman, emerged from the sitting room. Going? What did they ever come for? My dear madam, remonstrated Mr. Pickwick, looking up. Get along with you, you old wretch, replied Mrs. Raddle, hastily withdrawing her nightcap. Old enough to be his grandfather, you villain. You're worse than any of them. Mr. Pickwick found it in vain to protest his innocence, so hurried downstairs into the street. <laughs> Christmas time finds Mr. Pickwick and his three companions once again back at Dingley Dell, where Mr. Wardle has gathered a large house party to celebrate the season. Among the guests are the two medical students, Bob Sawyer and Benjamin Allen. Now, said Mr. Wardle, after a substantial lunch with the agreeable items of strong beer and cherry brandy had been done ample justice to, what say you to an hour on the ice? We shall have plenty of time. Capital, said Mr. Benjamin Allen. Prime, ejaculated Mr. Bob Sawyer. You skate, of course, Winkle, said Wardle. Uh, yes, oh, yes, replied Mr. Winkle. I, I, I'm, I'm rather out of practice. Oh, do skate, Mr. Winkle, said Arabella. I like to see it so much. Oh, it is so graceful, said another young lady. A third young lady said it was elegant, and a fourth expressed her opinion that it was swan-like. I should be very happy, I'm sure, said Mr. Winkle, reddening, but I have no skates. This objection was at once overruled. Trundle had a couple of pair, and the fat boy announced that there were half a dozen more downstairs, whereat Mr. Winkle expressed exquisite delight and looked exquisitely uncomfortable. Old Wardle led the way to a pretty large sheet of ice, and the fat boy and Mr. Weller, having shoveled and swept away the snow which had fallen on it during the night, Mr. Bob Sawyer adjusted his skates with a dexterity which to Mr. Winkle was perfectly marvellous, and described circles with his left leg, and cut figures of eight, and inscribed upon the ice without once stopping for breath a great many other pleasant and astonishing devices, to the excessive satisfaction of Mr. Pickwick, Mr. Tupman and the ladies which reached a pitch of positive enthusiasm when old Wardle and Benjamin Allen, assisted by the aforesaid Bob Sawyer, performed some mystic evolutions, which they called a reel. All this time, Mr. Winkle, with his face and hands blue with the cold, had been forcing a gimlet into the soles of his feet and putting his skates on with the points behind, and getting the straps in a very complicated and entangled state, with the assistance of Mr. Snodgrass, who knew rather less about skates than a Hindu. At length, however, with the assistance of Mr. Weller, the unfortunate skates were firmly screwed and buckled on, and Mr. Winkle was raised to his feet. Now then, sir, said Sam, in an encouraging tone, off with you, and show him how to do it. Stop, Sam, stop, said Mr. Winkle, trembling violently and clutching hold of Sam's arms with the grasp of a drowning man. How slippery it is, Sam! Not an uncommon thing upon ice, sir, replied Mr. Weller. Hold up, sir. This last observation of Mr. Weller's bore reference to a demonstration Mr. Winkle made at the instant of a frantic desire to throw his feet in the air and dash the back of his head on the ice. These, these are, are very awkward skates, aren't they, Sam? inquired Mr. Winkle, staggering. I'm afeard there's an awkward gentleman in em, sir, replied Sam. Now, Winkle, cried Mr. Pickwick, quite unconscious that there was anything the matter. Come! The ladies are all anxiety. Yes, yes, replied Mr. Winkle with a ghastly smile. I I'm coming. Just a going to begin, said Sam, endeavouring to disengage himself. Now, sir, start off. Stop an instant, Sam, gasped Mr. Winkle, clinging most affectionately to Mr. Weller. I find I've got a couple of coats at home that I don't want, Sam. You may have them, Sam. Thank ye, sir, replied Mr. Weller. Never mind touching your hat, Sam, said Mr. Winkle hastily. You needn't take your hand away to do that. 
I meant to have given you five shillings this morning for a Christmas box, Sam. I'll give it to you this afternoon, Sam. You're very good, sir, replied Mr. Weller. Just hold me at first, Sam, will you, said Mr. Winkle. There, that's right. I shall soon get in the way of it, Sam. Not too fast, Sam, not too fast. Mr. Winkle, stooping forward, with his body half doubled up, was being assisted over the ice by Mr. Weller in a very singular and unswan-like manner, when Mr. Pickwick most innocently shouted from the opposite bank, Sam, sir, here, I want you. Let go, sir, said Sam. Don't you hear the governor calling? Let go, sir. With a violent effort, Mr. Weller disengaged himself from the grasp of the agonised Pickwickian and, in so doing, administered a considerable impetus to the unhappy Mr. Winkle. With an accuracy which no degree of dexterity or practice could have ensured, that unfortunate gentleman bore swiftly down into the centre of the reel, at the very moment when Mr. Bob Sawyer was performing a flourish of unparalleled beauty. Mr. Winkle struck wildly against him, and with a loud crash they both fell heavily down. Mr. Pickwick ran to the spot. Bob Sawyer had risen to his feet, but Mr. Winkle was far too wise to do anything of the kind in skates. He was seated on the ice, making spasmodic efforts to smile, but anguish was depicted on every lineament of his countenance. "'Are you hurt?' inquired Mr. Benjamin Allen with great anxiety. "'Not much,' said Mr. Winkle, rubbing his back very hard. "'I wish you'd let me bleed you,' said Mr. Benjamin with great eagerness. Uh, "'No, thank you,' replied Mr. Winkle hurriedly. "'I really think you better had,' said Allen. Uh, "'Thank you,' replied Mr. Winkle. I, "'I'd rather not.' "'What do you think, Mr. Pickwick?' inquired Bob Sawyer. Mr. Pickwick was excited and indignant. He beckoned to Mr. Weller and said in a stern voice, "'Take his skates off.' "'No, but really, I'd scarcely begun,' remonstrated Mr. Winkle. "'Take his skates off,' repeated Mr. Pickwick firmly. The command was not to be resisted. Mr. Winkle allowed Sam to obey it in silence. "'Lift him up,' said Mr. Pickwick. Sam assisted him to rise.' Mr. Pickwick retired a few paces apart from the bystanders, and beckoning his friend to approach, fixed a searching look upon him, and uttered in a low but distinct and emphatic tone these remarkable words. You are a humbug, sir. A what? said Mr. Winkle, starting. A humbug, sir. I will speak plainer if you wish it. An impostor, sir. With these words, Mr. Pickwick turned slowly on his heel and rejoined his friends. While Mr. Pickwick was delivering himself of the sentiment just recorded, Mr. Weller and the fat boy, having by their joint endeavours cut out a slide, were exercising themselves thereupon in a very masterly and brilliant manner. Sam Weller in particular was displaying that beautiful feat of fancy sliding which is currently denominated knocking at the cobbler's door and which is achieved by skimming over the ice on one foot and occasionally giving a postman's knock upon it with the other. It was a good long slide and there was something in the motion which Mr Pickwick, who was very cold with standing still, could not help envying. It looks a nice warm exercise that, doesn't it? he inquired of Wardle when that gentleman was thoroughly out of breath by reason of the indefatigable manner in which he'd converted his legs into a pair of compasses and drawn complicated problems on the ice. Ah, it does indeed, replied Wardle. Do you slide? Well, I used to do so on the gutters when I was a boy, replied Mr Pickwick. Try it now, said Wardle. Oh, do please, Mr Pickwick, cried all the ladies. I should be very happy to afford you any amusement, replied Mr Pickwick, but I haven't done such a thing these thirty years. Pooh, pooh, nonsense, said Wardle, dragging off his skates with the impetuosity which characterised all his proceedings. Here, I'll keep you company, come along. And away went the good-tempered old fellow down the slide, with a rapidity which came very close upon Mr Weller, and beat the fat boy all to nothing. Mr Pickwick paused, considered, pulled off his gloves and put them in his hat, took two or three short runs, balked himself as often, and at last took another run and went slowly and gravely down the slide, with his feet about a yard and a quarter apart, amidst the gratified shouts of all the spectators. "'Keep the pot boiling, sir,' said Sam, 
and down went Wardle again, and then Mr. Pickwick, and then Sam, and then Mr. Winkle, and then Mr. Bob Sawyer, and then the fat boy, and then Mr. Snodgrass, following closely upon each other's heels, and running after each other with as much eagerness as if all their future prospects in life depended on their expedition. It was the most intensely interesting thing to observe the manner in which Mr. Pickwick performed his share of the ceremony to watch the torture of anxiety with which he viewed the person behind gaining upon him at the imminent hazard of tripping him up, to see him gradually expend the painful force he'd put on at first and turn slowly round on the slide with his face towards the point from which he'd started, to contemplate the playful smile which mantled on his face when he had accomplished the distance and the eagerness with which he turned round when he'd done so and ran after his predecessor his black gaiters tripping pleasantly through the snow, and his eyes beaming cheerfulness and gladness through his spectacles. And when he was knocked down, which happened upon the average every third round, it was the most invigorating sight that can possibly be imagined to behold him gather up his hat, gloves and handkerchief with a glowing countenance and resume his station in the rank with an ardour and enthusiasm that nothing could abate. The sport was at its height, the sliding was at its quickest, the laughter was at its loudest, when a sharp, smart crack was heard. There was a quick rush towards the bank, a wild scream from the ladies and a shout from Mr Tupman. A large mass of ice disappeared. The water bubbled up over it. Mr Pickwick's hat, gloves and handkerchief were floating on the surface, and this was all of Mr Pickwick that anybody could see. Dismay and anguish were depicted on every countenance. The males turned pale and the females fainted. Mr Snodgrass and Mr Winkle grasped each other by the hand and gazed at the spot where their leader had gone down with frenzied eagerness. While Mr Tupman, by way of rendering the promptest assistance and at the same time conveying to any persons who might be within hearing the clearest possible notion of the catastrophe, ran off across the country at his utmost speed, screaming, Fire! with all his might. It was at this moment, when old Wardle and Sam Weller were approaching the hole with cautious steps, and Mr Benjamin Allen was holding a hurried consultation with Mr Bob Sawyer on the advisability of bleeding the company generally as an improving little bit of professional practice, it was at this very moment that a face, head and shoulders emerged from beneath the water and disclosed the features and spectacles of Mr Pickwick. Keep yourself up for an instant, only for one instant, bawled Mr Snodgrass. Yes, do, let me implore you for my sake, roared Mr Winkle, deeply affected. The adjuration was rather unnecessary, the probability being that if Mr Pickwick had declined to keep himself up for anybody else's sake, it would have occurred to him that he might as well do it for his own. Do you feel the bottom there, old fellow, said Wardle? Yes, certainly, replied Mr Pickwick, wringing the water from his head and face and gasping for breath. I fell upon my back. I couldn't get on my feet at first. The clay upon so much of Mr Pickwick's coat as was yet visible bore testimony to the accuracy of this statement, and as the fears of the spectators were still further relieved by the fat boy suddenly recollecting that the water was nowhere more than five feet deep, prodigies of valour were performed to get him out. After a vast quantity of splashing and cracking and struggling, Mr Pickwick was at length fairly extricated from his unpleasant position and once more stood on dry land. Oh, he'll catch his death of cold, said Emily. Dear old thing, said Arabella, let me wrap this shawl round you, Mr Pickwick. Ah, that's the best thing you could do, said Wardle, and when you've got it on, run home as fast as your legs can carry you and jump into bed directly. A dozen shawls were offered on the instant. Three or four of the thickest having been selected, Mr Pickwick was wrapped up and started off under the guidance of Mr Weller, presenting the singular phenomenon of an elderly gentleman dripping wet and without a hat, with his arms bound to his sides, skimming over the ground without any clearly defined purpose at the rate of six good English miles an hour. But Mr Pickwick cared not for appearances in such an extreme case, and urged on by Sam Weller, he kept at the very top of his speed until he reached the door of Manor Farm. Mr Pickwick paused not an instant until he was snug in bed. Sam Weller lighted a blazing fire in the room and took up his dinner. A bowl of punch was carried up afterwards, and a grand carouse held in honour of his safety.
Old Wardle would not hear of his rising, so they made the bed the chair, and Mr Pickwick presided. A second and a third bowl were ordered in, and when Mr Pickwick awoke next morning, there was not a symptom of rheumatism about him, which proves, as Mr Bob Sawyer very justly observed, that there is nothing like hot punch in such cases, and that if ever hot punch did fail to act as a preventative, it was merely because the patient fell into the vulgar error of not taking enough of it. Mr. Pickwick's many adventures and encounters, none was more important and revealing than his encounter with the law. It all begins, quite early in the story, with a completely innocent misunderstanding, and on the very day that Mr. Pickwick engaged the services of the faithful Sam Weller. Mr. Pickwick's apartments in Goswell Street, although on a limited scale, were not only of a very neat and comfortable description, but peculiarly adapted for the residence of a man of his genius and observation. His sitting room was the first floor front, his bedroom the second floor front, and thus, whether he was sitting at his desk in his parlour, or standing before the dressing glass in his dormitory, he had an equal opportunity of contemplating human nature in all the numerous phases it exhibits, in that not more populous than popular thoroughfare. His landlady, Mrs. Bardell, the relict and sole executrix of a deceased custom house officer, was a comely woman of bustling manners and agreeable appearance, with a natural genius for cooking, improved by study and long practice, into an exquisite talent. There were no children, no servants, no fowls. The only other inmates of the house were a large man and a small boy. The first a lodger, the second a production of Mrs. Bardell's. Cleanliness and quiet reigned throughout the house, and in it Mr. Pickwick's will was law. To anyone acquainted with these points of the domestic economy of the establishment and conversant with the admirable regulation of Mr. Pickwick's mind, his appearance and behaviour on this morning would have been most mysterious and unaccountable. He paced the room to and fro with hurried steps, popped his head out of the window at intervals of about three minutes each, constantly referred to his watch, and exhibited many other manifestations of impatience, very unusual with him. It was evident that something of great importance was in contemplation, but what that something was, not even Mrs. Bardell herself had been able to discover. Mrs. Bardell, said Mr. Pickwick at last, as that amiable female approached the termination of a prolonged dusting of the apartment. Sir, said Mrs. Bardell, do you think it a much greater expense to keep two people than to keep one? La, Mr. Pickwick, said Mrs. Bardell, colouring up to the very border of her cap, as she fancied she observed a species of matrimonial twinkle in the eyes of her lodger. La, Mr. Pickwick, what a question. Well, but do you, inquired Mr. Pickwick. That depends, said Mrs. Bardell, approaching the duster very near to Mr. Pickwick's elbow, which was planted on the table. That depends a good deal upon the person you know, Mr. Pickwick, and whether it's a saving and careful person, sir. That's very true, said Mr. Pickwick, but the person I have in my eye, here he looked very hard at Mrs. Bardell, I think possesses these qualities, and has, moreover, a considerable knowledge of the world, and a great deal of sharpness, Mrs. Bardell, which may be of material use to me. La, Mr. Pickwick, said Mrs. Bardell, the crimson rising to her cap border again. I do, said Mr. Pickwick, growing energetic, as was his wont in speaking of a subject which interested him. I do indeed, 
And to tell you the truth, Mrs. Bardell, I have made up my mind. Dear me, sir, exclaimed Mrs. Bardell. You will think it very strange now, said the amiable Mr. Pickwick, with a good-humoured glance at his companion, that I have never consulted you about this matter and never mentioned it till I sent your little boy out this morning. Mrs. Bardell could only reply by a look. She had long worshipped Mr. Pickwick at a distance, but here she was, all at once, raised to a pinnacle to which her wildest and most extravagant hopes had never dared to aspire. Mr. Pickwick was going to propose. A deliberate plan, too. Sent her little boy to the borough to get him out of the way. Oh, how thoughtful, how considerate. Well, said Mr. Pickwick, what do you think? Oh, Mr. Pickwick, said Mrs. Bardell, trembling with agitation. You're very kind, sir. It'll save you a good deal of trouble, won't it, said Mr. Pickwick. Oh, I never thought of anything of the trouble, sir, replied Mrs. Bardell. And, of course, I should take more trouble to please you than ever. But it's so kind of you, Mr. Pickwick, to have so much consideration for my loneliness. Ah, to be sure, said Mr. Pickwick. I never thought of that. When I'm in town, you'll always have someone to sit with you. To be sure, so you will. I'm sure I ought to be a very happy woman, said Mrs. Bardell. And your little boy, said Mr. Pickwick. Bless his heart, interposed Mrs. Bardell, with a maternal sob. He too will have a companion, resumed Mr. Pickwick, a lively one who will teach him, I'll be bound, more tricks in a week than he'd ever learn in a year. And Mr. Pickwick smiled placidly. Oh, you dear, said Mrs. Bardell. Mr. Pickwick started. Oh, you kind, good, playful dear, said Mrs. Bardell. And without a more ado, she rose from her chair and flung her arms round Mr. Pickwick's neck with a cataract of tears and a chorus of sobs. Bless my soul, cried the astonished Mr. Pickwick. Mrs. Bardell, my good woman. Dear me, what a situation. Pray consider. Mrs. Bardell, don't, if anyone should come in. Oh, let them come, exclaimed Mrs. Bardell frantically. I'll never leave you, dear, kind, good soul. And with these words, Mrs. Bardell clung the tighter. Mercy upon me, said Mr. Pickwick, struggling violently. I hear someone coming on the stairs. Don't, don't, there's a good creature, don't. But entreaty and remonstrance were alike unavailing, for Mrs. Bardell had fainted in Mr. Pickwick's arms. And before he could gain time to deposit her on a chair, Master Bardell entered the room ushering in Mr. Tupman, Mr. Winkle, and Mr. Snodgrass. Mr. Pickwick was struck motionless and speechless. He stood with his lovely burden in his arms, gazing vacantly on the countenances of his friends, without the slightest attempt at recognition or explanation. They, in their turn, stared at him, and Master Bardell, in his turn, stared at everybody. The astonishment of the Pickwickians was so absorbing and the perplexity of Mr. Pickwick so extreme that they might have remained in exactly the same relative situations until the suspended animation of the lady was restored, had it not been for a most beautiful and touching expression of filial affection on the part of her youthful son. Clad in a tight suit of corduroy, spangled with brass buttons of a very considerable size, he at first stood at the door astounded and uncertain, but by degrees, the impression that his mother must have suffered some personal damage pervaded his partially developed mind, and considering Mr. Pickwick as the aggressor, he set up an appalling and semi-earthly kind of howling, and butting forward with his head, commenced assailing that immortal gentleman about the back and legs with such blows and pinches as the strength of his arms and the violence of his excitement allowed. "'Take this little villain away,' said the agonised Mr. Pickwick. "'He's mad!' "'What is the matter?' said the three tongue-tied Pickwickians. "'I don't know,' replied Mr. Pickwick pettishly. "'Take away the boy.' Here Mr. Winkle carried the interesting boy, screaming and struggling, to the farther end of the apartment. "'Now help me lead this woman downstairs.' "'Oh, I'm better now,' said Mrs. Bardell faintly. "'Let me lead you downstairs,' said the ever-gallant Mr. Tupman. "'Thank you, sir. Thank you,' exclaimed Mrs. Bardell hysterically, and down the stairs she was led accordingly, accompanied by her affectionate son. "'I cannot conceive,' said Mr. Pickwick, when his friends returned, "'I cannot conceive what has been the matter with that woman. I had merely announced to her my intention of keeping a manservant, when she fell into the extraordinary paroxysms in which you found her. "'Very extraordinary thing?' "'Very,' said his three friends. "'Placed me in such an extremely awkward situation,' continued Mr. Pickwick. "'Very,' was the reply of his followers, as they coughed slightly, 
and looked dubiously at one another. This behaviour was not lost upon Mr. Pickwick. He remarked their incredulity. They evidently suspected him. There is a man in the passage now, said Mr. Tupman. It's the man I spoke to you about, said Mr. Pickwick. I sent for him up to the borough this morning. Have the goodness to call him up, Snodgrass. Mr. Snodgrass did as he was desired, and Mr. Samuel Weller forthwith presented himself. Oh, you remember me, I suppose, said Mr. Pickwick. I should think so, replied Sam, with a patronising wink. Sit down, said Mr. Pickwick. Thank you, sir, said Sam, and down he sat without further bidding, having previously deposited his old white hat on the landing outside the door. Don't know where he good to look at, said Sam, but it's an astonishing and to wear, and afore the brim went it were a wery handsome tile. Howsoever, it's lighter without it, and that's one thing, and every hole lets in some air, that's another. Wit elation gossamer, I calls it. On the delivery of this sentiment, Mr. Weller smiled agreeably upon the assembled Pickwickians. Now, with regard to the matter on which I, with the concurrence of these gentlemen, sent for you, said Mr. Pickwick. That's the point, sir, interposed Sam. Out with it, as the father said to the child when he swallowed a farden. We want to know in the first place, said Mr. Pickwick, whether you have any reason to be discontented with your present situation. Afore I answers that there question, gentlemen, replied Mr. Weller, I should like to know in the first place whether you are going to provide me with a better. A sunbeam of placid benevolence played on Mr. Pickwick's features as he said, I have half made up my mind to engage you myself. Have you, though, said Sam. Mr. Pickwick nodded in the affirmative. Wages, said Sam. Twelve pounds a year, replied Mr. Pickwick. Clothes, two suits. Work, to attend upon me and to travel about with me and these gentlemen here. Take the bill down, said Sam emphatically. I'm let to a single gentleman and the terms is agreed on. Mr. Pickwick, with his three companions and Sam, went off on his travels and thought no more about the incident. But Mrs. Bardell did not forget. And finally, she was persuaded by a pair of unscrupulous lawyers, Messrs. Dodson and Fogg, to sue Mr. Pickwick for breach of promise. After many delays, the court hearing begins. Bardell and Pickwick, cried the gentleman in black, calling on the case which stood first on the list. I am for the plaintiff, my lord, said Mr. Sergeant Buzzfuzz. Who is with you, Brother Buzzfuzz, said the judge. Mr. Skimpin bowed to intimate that he was. I appear for the defendant, my lord, said Mr. Sergeant Snubbin. Anybody with you, Brother Snubbin, inquired the court. Mr. Funky, my lord, replied Sergeant Snubbin. Sergeant Buzzfuzz and Mr. Skimpin for the plaintiff, said the judge, writing down the names in his notebook and reading as he wrote. For the defendant, Sergeant Snubbin and Mr. Monkey. Beg your lordship's pardon, Funky. Oh, very good, said the judge. I never had the pleasure of hearing the gentleman's name before. Here, Mr. Funky bowed and smiled, and the judge bowed and smiled too. And then Mr. Funky, blushing into the very whites of his eyes, tried to look as if he didn't know that everybody was gazing at him, a thing which no man ever succeeded in doing yet, or in all reasonable probability ever will. Go on, said the judge. The ushers again called silence, and Mr. Skimpin proceeded to open the case, and the case appeared to have very little inside it when he had opened it, for he kept such particulars as he knew completely to himself, and sat down after a lapse of three minutes, leaving the jury in precisely the same advanced stage of wisdom as they were in before. Sergeant Buzzfuzz then rose, with all the majesty and dignity which the grave nature of the proceedings demanded, and having whispered to Dodson and conferred briefly with Fogg, pulled his gown over his shoulders, settled his wig, and addressed the jury. Sergeant Buzzfuzz began by saying that never, in the whole course of his professional experience, never, from the very first moment of his applying himself to the study and practice of the law, had he approached a case with feelings of such deep emotion or with such a heavy sense of the responsibility imposed upon him. A responsibility, he would say, which he could never have supported, were he not buoyed up and sustained by a conviction so strong 
that it amounted to positive certainty that the cause of truth and justice, or in other words, the cause of his much injured and most oppressed client, must prevail with the high-minded and intelligent dozen of men whom he now saw in that box before him. You have heard from my learned friend, gentlemen, continued Sergeant Buzzfuzz, well knowing that from the learned friend alluded to, the gentleman of the jury had heard just nothing at all. You have heard from my learned friend, gentlemen, that this is an action for a breach of promise of marriage in which the damages are laid at fifteen hundred pounds. But you have not heard from my learned friend, inasmuch as it did not come within my learned friend's province to tell you, what are the facts and circumstances of the case? Those facts and circumstances, gentlemen, you shall hear detailed by me and proved by the unimpeachable female whom I will place in that box before you. Here, Mr. Sergeant Buzzfuzz, with a tremendous emphasis on the word box, smote his table with a mighty sound and glanced at Dodson and Fogg, who nodded admiration of the sergeant and indignant defiance of the defendant. The plaintiff, gentlemen, continued Sergeant Buzzfuzz in a soft and melancholy voice, the plaintiff is a widow. Yes, gentlemen, a widow. The late Mr. Bardell, after enjoying for many years the esteem and confidence of his sovereign as one of the guardians of his royal revenues, glided almost imperceptibly from the world to seek elsewhere for that repose and peace which a custom house officer can never afford. At this pathetic description of the decease of Mr. Bardell, who had been knocked on the head with a court pot in a public house cellar, the learned sergeant's voice faltered, and he proceeded with emotion. Some time before his death, he had stamped his likeness upon the little boy. With this boy, the only pledge of her departed exciseman, Mrs. Bardell shrunk from the world and courted the retirement and tranquility of Goswell Street. And here she placed in her front parlour window a written placard bearing this inscription, Apartments furnished for a single gentleman, inquire within. Here Sergeant Buzzfuzz paused, while several gentlemen of the jury took a note of the document. There is no date to that, is there, sir? inquired the jury. There is no date, gentlemen, replied Sergeant Buzzfuzz but I am instructed to say that it was put in the plaintiff's parlour window just this time three years. I entreat the attention of the jury to the wording of this document. Apartments furnished for a single gentleman. Mrs. Bardell's opinion of the opposite sex gentlemen were derived from a long contemplation of the inestimable qualities of her lost husband. She had no fear. She had no distrust. She had no suspicion. All was confidence and reliance. Mr. Bardell, said the widow. Mr. Bardell was a man of honour. Mr. Bardell was a man of his word. Mr. Bardell was no deceiver. Mr. Bardell was once a single gentleman himself. Two single gentlemen, I looked for protection, for assistance, for comfort and for consolation. In single gentlemen, I shall perpetually see something to remind me of what Mr. Bardell was when he first won my young and untried affections. To a single gentleman, then, shall my lodgings be let. Actuated by this beautiful and touching impulse, among the best impulses of our imperfect nature, gentlemen, the lonely and desolate widow dried her tears, furnished her first floor, caught the innocent boy to her maternal bosom and put the bill up in her parlour window. Did it remain there long? No. The serpent was on the watch. Before the bill had been in the parlour window three days, three days, gentlemen, a being, erect upon two legs and bearing all the outward semblance of a man and not of a monster, knocked on the door of Mrs. Bardell's house. He inquired within, he took the lodgings, and on the very next day he entered into possession of them. This man was Pickwick. Pickwick, the defendant. Sergeant Buzzfuzz, who had proceeded with such volubility that his face was perfectly crimson, here paused for breath. The silence awoke Mr. Justice Stairley who immediately wrote down something with a pen without any ink in it and looked unusually profound to impress the jury with the belief 
that he always thought most deeply with his eyes shut. Sergeant Balsfords proceeded. Of this man, Pickwick, I will say little. The subject presents but few attractions, and I, gentlemen, am not the man, nor are you, gentlemen, the men, to delight in the contemplation of revolting heartlessness and systematic villainy. Here, Mr. Pickwick, who had been writhing in silence for some time, gave a violent start, as if some vague idea of assaulting Sergeant Buzzfuzz in the august presence of justice and law suggested itself to his mind. I say systematic villainy, gentlemen, said Sergeant Buzzfuzz, looking through Mr. Pickwick and talking at him. And when I say systematic villainy, let me tell the defendant Pickwick, if he be in court, as I am informed that he is, that it would have been more decent in him, more becoming, in better judgment and in better taste, if he had stopped away. Let me tell him, gentlemen, that any gestures of dissent or disapprobation in which he may indulge in this court will not go down with you, and that you will know how to value and how to appreciate them. And let me tell him further, as my lord will tell you, gentlemen, that a counsel in the discharge of his duty to his client is neither to be intimidated or bullied, nor put down, and that any attempt to do either, the one or the other, or the first or the last, will recoil on the head of the attempter, be he plaintiff or be he defendant, be his name Pickwick or Noakes or Stokes or Stiles or Brown or Thompson. This little divergence from the subject in hand had, of course, the intended effect of turning all eyes on Mr Pickwick. Sergeant Buzzfuzz, having partially recovered from the state of moral elevation into which he had lashed himself, resumed. I shall show you, gentlemen that for two years Pickwick continued to reside constantly and without interruption or intermission at Mrs. Bardell's house. I shall show you that Mrs. Bardell, during the whole of that time, waited on him, attended to his comforts, cooked his meals, looked out his linen for the washerwoman when it went abroad, darned, aired and prepared it for wear when it came home, and, in short, enjoyed his fullest trust and confidence. I shall prove to you, gentlemen, that about a year ago, Pickwick suddenly began to absent himself from home during long intervals, as if with the intention of gradually breaking off from my client. But I shall show you also that his resolution was not at that time sufficiently strong, or that his better feelings conquered, if better feelings he has, or that the charms and accomplishments of my client prevailed against his unmanly intentions, by proving to you that on one occasion, when he returned from the country, he distinctly and in terms offered her marriage, previously, however, taking special care that there should be no witness to their solemn contract. And I am in a situation to prove to you, on the testimony of three of his friends, most unwilling witnesses, gentlemen, most unwilling witnesses, that on that morning... He was discovered by them holding the plaintiff in his arms and soothing her agitation by his caresses and endearments. A visible impression was produced upon the auditors by this part of the learned sergeant's address. Drawing forth two very small scraps of paper, he proceeded. And now, gentlemen, but one word more. Two letters have passed between these parties. Letters which are admitted to be in the handwriting of the defendant, and which speak volumes indeed. These letters bespeak the character of the man. They are not open, fervent, eloquent epistles, breathing nothing but the language of affectionate attachment. They are covert, sly, underhanded communications, but, fortunately, far more conclusive than if couched in the most glowing language and the most poetic imagery. Letters that must be viewed with a cautious and suspicious eye. Letters that were evidently intended at the time by Pickwick to mislead and delude any third parties into whose hands they might fall. Let me read the first. Garraway's, 12 o'clock. Dear Mrs. B, chops and tomato sauce, yours, Pickwick. Gentlemen, What does this mean? Chops and tomato sauce, yours, Pickwick. Chops! Gracious heavens and tomato sauce! 
gentleman, is the happiness of a sensitive and confiding female to be trifled away by such shallow artifices as these? The next has no date whatever, which is in itself suspicious. Dear Mrs. B., I shall not be home till tomorrow, slow coach. And then follows this very remarkable expression. Don't trouble yourself about the warming pan. The warming pan. Why, gentlemen, who does trouble himself about a warming pan? When was the peace of mind of a man or woman broken or disturbed by a warming pan, which is in itself a harmless, a useful, and I will add, gentlemen, a comforting article of domestic furniture. Why is Mrs. Bardell so earnestly entreated not to agitate herself about this warming pan unless, as is no doubt the case, it is a mere cover for hidden fire, a mere substitute for some endearing word or promise, artfully contrived by Pickwick with a view to his contemplated desertion, and which I am not in a condition to explain? And what does this allusion to the slow coach mean? For aught I know, it may be a reference to Pickwick himself, who has most unquestionably been a criminally slow coach during the whole of this transaction, but whose speed will now be very unexpectedly accelerated, and whose wheels, gentlemen, as he will find to his cost, will very soon be greased by you. But enough of this, gentlemen, said Mr. Sergeant Buzzfuzz. It is difficult to smile with an aching heart. It is ill jesting when our deepest sympathies are awakened. My client's hopes and prospects are ruined. And it is no figure of speech to say that her occupation is gone indeed. The bill is down, but there is no tenant. Eligible single gentlemen pass and repass, but there is no invitation for them to inquire within or without. All is gloom and silence in the house. Even the voice of the child is hushed. His infant sports are disregarded when his mother weeps. But Pickwick, gentlemen, Pickwick, the ruthless destroyer of this domestic oasis in the desert of Goswell Street, Pickwick, who has choked up the well and thrown ashes on the sward, Pickwick, who comes before you today with his heartless tomato sauce and warming pans, Pickwick still rears his head with unblushing effrontery and gazes without a sigh on the ruin he has made. Damages, gentlemen, heavy damages, is the only punishment with which you can visit him, the only recompense you can award to my client. And for those damages she now appeals to an enlightened, a high-minded, a right-feeling, a conscientious, a dispassionate, a sympathizing, a contemplative jury of her civilized countrymen. With this beautiful peroration, Mr. Sergeant Buzzford sat down and Mr. Justice Stanley woke up. <laughs> Call Nathaniel Winkle, said Mr. Skimpin. Here, replied a feeble voice. Mr. Winkle entered the witness box, and having duly been sworn, bowed to the judge with considerable deference. Don't look at me, sir, said the judge sharply, in acknowledgement of the salute. Look at the jury. Mr. Winkle obeyed the mandate and looked at the place where he thought it most probable the jury might be, for seeing anything in his then state of intellectual complication was wholly out of the question. Mr. Winkle was then examined by Mr. Skimpin, who, being a promising young man of two or three and forty, was, of course, anxious to confuse a witness who was notoriously predisposed in favour of the other side as much as he could. Now, sir, said Mr. Skimpin, have the goodness to let his lordship and the jury know what your name is, will you? And Mr. Skimpin inclined his head on one side to listen with great sharpness to the answer, and glanced at the jury meanwhile, as if to imply that he rather expected Mr. Winkle's natural taste for perjury would induce him to give some name which did not belong to him. Winkle, replied the witness, 
What's your Christian name, sir? Angrily inquired the little judge. Nathaniel, sir. Daniel? Any other name? Nathaniel, sir. Uh, my lord, I mean. Nathaniel Daniel or Daniel Nathaniel? No, my lord, only Nathaniel, not Daniel at all. What did you tell me it was Daniel for then, sir? inquired the judge. I didn't, my lord, replied Mr. Winkle. You did, sir, replied the judge with a severe frown. How could I have got Daniel on my notes unless you told me so, sir? This argument was, of course, unanswerable. Mr. Winkle has rather a short memory, my lord, interposed Mr. Skimpin with another glance at the jury. We shall find means to refresh it before we've quite done with him, I dare say. You'd better be careful, sir, said the little judge with a sinister look at the witness. Poor Mr. Winkle bowed and endeavoured to feign an easiness of manner which, in his then state of confusion, gave him rather the air of a disconcerted pickpocket. Now, Mr. Winkle, said Mr. Skimpin, attend to me, if you please, and let me recommend you, for your own sake, to bear in mind his lordship's injunction to be careful. I believe you are a particular friend of Pickwick, the defendant, are you not? I have known Mr. Pickwick now, as well as I recollect at this moment, nearly... Pray, Mr. Winkle, do not evade the question. Are you or are you not a particular friend of the defendant's? I was just about to say that will you or will you not answer my question, sir? If you don't answer the question, you'll be committed, sir, interposed the little judge, looking over his notebook. Come, sir, said Mr. Skimpin, yes or no, if you please. Yes, I am, replied Mr. Winkle. Yes, you are. And why couldn't you say that at once, sir? Perhaps you know the plaintiff too, eh, Mr. Winkle? I don't know her. I've seen her. Oh, you don't know her, but you've seen her. Now, have the goodness to tell the gentlemen of the jury what you mean by that, Mr. Winkle. I mean that I am not intimate with her. "'but I have seen her when I went to call on Mr. Pickwick in Goswell Street. "'Pray, Mr. Winkle, do you remember calling on the defendant Pickwick "'at these apartments in the plaintiff's house in Goswell Street "'on one particular morning in the month of July last?' "'Yes, I do. "'Were you accompanied on that occasion by a friend of the name of Tupman "'and another of the name of Snodgrass?' "'Yes, I was. "'Are they here?' "'Yes, they are,' replied Mr. Winkle.' "'looking very earnestly towards the spot where his friends were stationed. "'Pray attend to me, Mr. Winkle, and never mind your friends,' said Mr. Skimpin, "'with another expressive look at the jury. "'They must tell their stories without any previous consultation with you, "'if none has yet taken place.' "'Another look at the jury. "'Now, sir, tell the gentlemen of the jury what you saw "'on entering the defendant's room on this particular morning. "'Come, out with it, sir. We must have it sooner or later.' The defendant, Mr. Pickwick, was holding the plaintiff in his arms with his hand clasping her waist, replied Mr. Winkle with natural hesitation, and the plaintiff appeared to have fainted away. Did you hear the defendant say anything? I heard him call Mrs. Bardell a good creature, and I heard him ask her to compose herself, for what a situation it was if anyone should come, or words to that effect. Now, Mr. Winkle, I have only one more question to ask you and I beg you to bear in mind his lordship's caution. Will you undertake to swear that Pickwick, the defendant, did not say on the occasion in question, My dear Mrs. Bardell, you're a good creature. Compose yourself to this situation, for to this situation you must come, or words to that effect. I... I didn't understand him so, certainly, said Mr. Winkle, astounded at this ingenious dovetailing of the few words he'd heard. I was on the staircase and couldn't hear distinctly. The impression on my mind is... The gentlemen of the jury want none of the impressions on your mind, Mr. Winkle, which I fear would be of little service to honest, straightforward men, interposed Mr. Skimpin. You were on the staircase and didn't distinctly hear, but you will not swear that Pickwick did not make use of the expressions I have quoted. Do I understand that? No, I will not, replied Mr. Winkle. And down sat Mr. Skimpin with a triumphant countenance. <laughs> Mr. Pickwick's case had not gone off in so particularly happy a manner up to this point that it could well afford to have any additional suspicion cast upon it. 
but as it could afford to be placed in a rather better light if possible, Mr. Funky rose for the purpose of getting something important out of Mr. Winkle in cross-examination. I believe, Mr. Winkle, said Mr. Funky, that Mr. Pickwick is not a young man. Oh, no, replied Mr. Winkle, old enough to be my father. You have told my learned friend that you have known Mr. Pickwick a long time. Had you ever any reason to suppose or believe that he was about to be married? Oh, no, certainly not, replied Mr. Winkle, with so much eagerness that Mr. Funky ought to have got him out of the box with all possible dispatch. Lawyers hold that there are two kinds of particularly bad witness, a reluctant witness and a too willing witness. It was Mr. Winkle's fate to figure in both characters. I will even go further than this, Mr. Winkle, continued Mr. Funky, in a most smooth and complacent manner, did you ever see anything in Mr. Pickwick's manner and conduct towards the opposite sex to induce you to believe that he ever contemplated matrimony of late years, in any case? Oh, no, certainly not, replied Mr. Winkle. You have never known anything in his behaviour towards Mrs. Bardell or any other female in the least degree suspicious, said Mr. Funky, preparing to sit down. The Sergeant Snubbin was winking at him. N n no, replied Mr. Winkle, except on one trifling occasion which I have no doubt might easily be explained. The moment the words fell from Mr. Winkle's lips, Mr. Funky sat down, and Sergeant Snubbin rather hastily told him he might leave the box, which Mr. Winkle prepared to do with great readiness, when Sergeant Buzzfuzz stopped him. Stay, Mr. Winkle, stay, said Sergeant Buzzfuzz. Will your lordship have the goodness to ask him... What this one instance of suspicious behaviour towards females on the part of this gentleman who is old enough to be his father was. Amid the profound silence of the whole court, Mr. Winkle faltered out that the trifling circumstance of suspicion was Mr. Pickwick's being found in a lady's sleeping apartment at midnight, which had terminated, he believed, in the breaking off of the projected marriage of the lady in question and had led, he knew, to the whole party being forcibly carried before George Napkins, Esquire, Magistrate and Justice of the Peace for the Borough of Ipswich. You may leave the box, sir, said Sergeant Snubbin. Mr. Winkle did leave the box, and rushed with delirious haste to the Georgian Vulture, where he was discovered some hours after by the waiter, groaning in a hollow and dismal manner with his head buried beneath the sofa cushions. <laughs> Mr. Justice Stairley summed up in the old established and most approved form. He read as much of his notes to the jury as he could decipher on so short a notice and made running comments on the evidence as he went along. If Mrs. Bardell were right, it was perfectly clear that Mr. Pickwick was wrong. If they were satisfied that a breach of promise of marriage had been committed, they would fine for the plaintiff with such damages as they thought proper. And if, on the other hand, it appeared to them that no promise of marriage had ever been given, they would find for the defendant with no damages at all. The jury then retired to their private room to talk the matter over, and the judge retired to his private room to refresh himself with a mutton chop and a glass of sherry. An anxious quarter of an hour elapsed. The jury came back. The judge was fetched in. Mr. Pickwick put on his spectacles and gazed at the foreman with an agitated countenance and a quickly beating heart. Gentlemen, said the individual in black, are you all agreed upon your verdict? We are, replied the foreman. Do you find for the plaintiff, gentlemen, or for the defendant? For the plaintiff. With what damages, gentlemen? Seven hundred and fifty pounds. Mr. Pickwick took off his spectacles, carefully wiped the glasses, folded them in their case, and put them in his pocket. Then, having drawn on his gloves with great nicety, and stared at the foreman all the while, he mechanically followed his solicitor, Mr. Perker, and the blue bag, out of court. They stopped in a side room while Perker paid the court fees, and here Mr. Pickwick was joined by his friends. Here, too, he encountered Messrs. Dodson and Fogg, rubbing their hands with every token of outward satisfaction. Well, gentlemen, said Mr. Pickwick. Well, sir, said Dodson, for self and partner. 
You imagine you'll get your costs, don't you, gentlemen, said Mr Pickwick. Fogg said they thought it rather probable. Dodson smiled and said they'd try. You may try and try and try again, Messrs Dodson and Fogg, said Mr Pickwick vehemently. But not one farthing of costs or damages do you ever get from me if I spend the rest of my existence in a debtor's prison. Mr Pickwick was as good as his word. He would not pay the money, and so he was sent to the fleet prison. After a few weeks, Mrs Bardell is sent to prison as well by her own lawyers, Dodson and Fogg, because she owes them their costs. Mrs Bardell is very contrite by now. She asks Mr Pickwick's pardon and gives him a letter saying the charge against him was false, and in return he pays the legal costs for her and they both leave prison. After two years of travel and adventure, Mr Pickwick and his friends decide to separate and settle down. Mr Winkle and Mr Snodgrass are both married by now, and Mr Pickwick, attended as always by Sam Weller, takes a house at Dulwich in London to enjoy a quieter life, but one rich with all the friendships he made on his many travels. <laughs>